begin with a stunning slideshow. So why don't you set that up for us? Yeah, all right. Uh, first, let me say that I'm happy to be back home. And I knew I was back home when I met <clears throat> Jimmy Griffin and Paul Wood, two of my old friends out in the hall. They said, hi, Blue. <laughs> when they said, Blue, I knew I was back home. And uh, the slides that uh, I'm going to show, uh, some few things I picked up before I left New York, I just remembered that I do have to take some slides. So I had to go in my icebox and pull off some. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy to be here with Susan, who is uh, grandfather Paul Robeson, was my, one of my heroes. I didn't have many heroes, but he was one of them. And so I'm very proud that things have gone full circle. He would be very happy to know that we're here together. Now, on the slides, I need to
abstract is just stunning. And um, maybe we could start by just getting, I mean, how did that all begin for you? <coughs> Working in that? Well, I um, again, I realized I didn't finish high school. <laughs> and then I had to <coughs> do something about it. I wanted to be somebody. I had a, in Kansas, uh, a, a white teacher who used to tell the black students that uh, we shouldn't only worry about finishing high school because if we went tried to go to college, it was going to cost our parents a lot of money and we would only be poor as a maid. And I didn't want to take her advice. I wanted to be somebody. My mother and father wanted to be somebody. And uh, this year when I got my 29th doctor, I wish this McClendon was around so I could hand it. <laughs> Started. My mom and dad wanted me to be somebody, and my 14 brothers and sisters wanted me to be somebody, and I was the youngest. And uh, that's, that's how it, uh, it, it happened, and I was determined that I was not going to disappoint them. Um, you wrote something about coming here to St. Paul and what that meant to you. I just want to read this briefly because it, it struck me. The first hard, cold winters I spent in St. Paul were most significant to me because it was in this impersonal North Country that I had to become a man at 16 on Parish. Also, it was the beginning of the true worth of my mother's teaching, teachings, those teachings that enabled me to survive. This was the real proving ground, the cold, the hunger, the frustration and fear. But, but from here came the strength that would sustain me in the giant worlds outside that I would later encounter. I value the experience. Um, what, what was going on in St. Paul? I, mean, that was I was starving at that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a mean brother-in-law who didn't like kids and uh, had, my mother just died and they shipped me from Kansas to there. And he didn't like kids in uh, 35 degrees below zero weather. And he kicked me out. And uh, that was it. I had to become a man overnight. Uh, and. Uh, I was frightened. I rode the street car between St. Paul, Minneapolis to the end of the line and would ride back to the end of St. Paul. By that time it was nearly dawn. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was happy when school opened up because they kicked me out around Christmas time and schools were closed. I was going to Mechanic Arts High School. but uh, I survived by playing piano on the north side of Minneapolis on the Hennepin Avenue and the Bardellas and so forth and so on and so forth. And later on, uh, played j uh, basketball with Jimmy Griffin up there and Paul Woods. And I think Jimmy and I played for a professional team called the House of David. Remember that, Jimmy? <laughs> and I survived the best way I could. In fact, that my whole life has been one of survival, trying to make right now trying to take care of uh, three ex-wives. <laughs> oh, whose fault is that? <laughs> so, was this, was this where you started, where you picked up a camera first? Was it no, this was where I picked up a camera. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, in fact, at that time I had become elevated to I waited on the North Coast Limited uh, Railway. Uh, I, I bought my first camera in, in Seattle, Washington, uh, which uh, cost me $7.50. It was called a Voigtlander Brilliant. Terrible camera, but what a great name to throw around. <laughs> Voigtlander Brilliant. I used the Voigtlander Brilliant. Uh, you you want to know what I first did with it? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I photographed beautiful girls for Cecil Newman's paper called St. Paul Ricardo. He didn't pay me. He <laughs> gave me a wonderful title called the uh, manager of, of current uh, something or other. Anyway, I didn't get any money. But I did get my picture of picture girl. I mean, the bravest stroke I made was when I went to, to Frank Murphy's beautiful store in St. Paul and with, just impulsively walked in and uh, uh, asked for Mr. Frank Murphy. And Frank came out in a beautiful gray flannel suit and uh, said, yes, what do you want? 
looked at me as though I was a buck. And uh, I said, I want to shoot fashion for you. He said, well, we got our fashion done in London, and Paris, and New York. In other words, get the hell out of here, you know. <laughs> but just as he had me out the door, Madeline, his wife, was a wonderful woman. She said, Frank, what does the young man want? He said he wants to shoot fashions. Well, Frank, how do you know he can't shoot fashion? Uh, Frank groaned, you know. And uh, she said, can you shoot fashions, young man? I said, yes, ma'am, I lied. Said, yes, ma'am. Uh, and she says, well, you come back tomorrow, I'll give you a chance, 6.30, after the store closes. Uh, Frank groaned again. Well, I rushed over to the University of Minnesota, a friend of mine named Harvey Goldstein. And Harvey uh, had a photographic story, he lent me money, he lent me film, he lent me cameras, he lent me everything. And when I told him I was going to shoot fashion for Frank Murphy, he said, are you crazy? You don't have a camera, you don't have film, and you can't shoot fashion. <laughs> he said, I agree with you, Harvey, but you're going to fix all that up today, you're going to let me have everything. Uh, well, I came back, Harvey was intimidated, he dropped me out on the corner. Uh, the models were there, the clothes were there, everything. Oh, well, first off, Mrs. Murphy had asked me, she said, how many models do you want? I said, three. She said, how many, how many dresses do you want? Uh, uh, Twelve. Uh, what kind? I said, formal. She said, fine. Frank groaned again. <laughs> well, I went back, Harvey dropped me out on the sidewalk, and I shot uh, pictures uh, that I was, Mrs. Murphy was impressed. Frank was impressed. Even I was impressed. <laughs> so about 12 o'clock, I find out I had double exposed everything to one picture. I took that picture back and told Mrs. Murphy what had happened. And she said, what, would they've all been that good? I said, oh, that's the worst one of all. <laughs> so she gave me another chance. And from there on, I was sort of on my way. Years later, I asked Madeline, I said, Madeline, why in the world on that particular day, when Frank had kicked me out of the store, did you call me back and give me a chance? She said, oh, I don't know, Gordon. I guess I was just mad as hell with Frank about something. <laughs> I said, I'm glad you were. So that's how it all started. And after that, I went on to Chicago, uh, New York, and Paris, and places that you've seen on the screen of it. And who were some of your, um, I mean, who inspired you? Did, was there some inspiration that you had as a photographer at that time? Were there certain role models or mentors, or you were just well, really fashioning it your own way? Uh, well, I got the Rosenwald Fellowship in Chicago after I, <coughs> Mrs. Murphy encouraged me to go to Chicago, and Marva Lewis, who was Joe Lewis's wife, saw some of the work in Murphy's, and she encouraged me to come. But I didn't shoot many fashions in Chicago. Instead, I, f I went to the south side of Chicago and shot uh, poverty stricken black areas. And that's what got me my Rosenwald Fellowship, and that <clears throat> what propelled me on to Washington to work under Roy Stryker at the Farm Security Administration. And that's when I met your father for the first time and encouraged me, Richard Wright, uh, and some of the other <clears throat> great, uh, Mrs. Bethune, some of the other great black people who I had read about when I was younger. And that's what propelled me. And your father was especially good to me. You know, he put his big hand on my shoulder once when I uh, left him and, and he sent me on to, a, to a home in a limousine and, and he said, tonight is my concert and you should come to that. And I said, oh, can I come? He says, yes. And I walked into the concert with his big hand on my shoulder. <laughs> and I was a hero. <laughs> and those were the things that uh, started me thinking uh, about people who I had never had a chance in Kansas as a young kid to read about. I didn't have any black heroes. All those history books were about white people. The movies were about William S. Hart, Hood Gibson, shooting Indians and things of that sort. So there was not, had not been much to encourage me. Uh, but I caught on pretty fast. And once I got started, well, things moved along. Right, so th that was pretty much in the, in the late 30s, early 40s? Uh, I'm in my late 40s now, darling. Okay. <laughs> you can say uh, this but, uh, yes, I, I came to Minnesota and I spent about, I had spent about four, 15 years in Kansas. 
and I spent about 20 years here until I became a man. Right, yeah, right. Man. And then, so during this time also, like into the 40s, you then were working for Life. You'd become a staff photographer. Uh, no, I didn't come to Life magazine so much later. I went to, first I went to Farm Security Administration mm -hmm. under Roy Stryker, where I worked with Dorothea Lang and all the great, uh, and Russell Lee, uh, John Vashon was from Minnesota, uh, and uh, Margaret Wilcott Post. It was the greatest bunch of uh, documentary photographers ever brought together, and I was, I went to work with them as a Rosemont Fellow. After that, I came to New York, uh, I went to work for Elmer Davis at the Office of War Information, I was a war correspondent for a while. Then I came to New York and went into, I had done, well, I hadn't done any much, any more fashion work. Uh, I went to see Alexei Brodovich at the Harper's Bazaar. He looked at my work and said, well, I like the work very much, but we got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, he said, uh, this is a Hearst organization, <coughs> and there's a rule here that we do not hire black people to do anything. Hmm. I said, oh, yeah, so we do, we have a problem. So I left. <laughs> I went to see uh, Edward Steichen, who was a very famous uh, photographer, and he, he said, uh, Dr. Fitch, some of men said that. <laughs> I said, yep. He said, here's a, another name, go see this man. That man happened to be Alexander Lieberman in Vogue. And uh, I went to see Alex and he looked at my work and he said, well, very good, uh, good work. I said, well, here it comes again. <laughs> he said, uh, we're going to give it a try. Never tried it, but we're going to try it. So I worked for Vogue for about five years and later went back to work for Stryker. And uh, that's the way things happen. You have a Madeline Murphy, you have an Alexander Lieberman. I really think Alex Zibrodovich uh, was sorry about what he had to say to me, but he did work for Horst organization. And later he told some of his classes that he was sorry that he did that to Garden Park. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 50s, um, I'm going to Paris in 1950, seems like it was a particular turning point. In Paris? You, yes, in yeah. terms of your growth. Yeah. Um, we have a, a, a short clip from a, from a documentary, your autobiograph autobiographical documentary, oh, really? Visions. Oh, Visions. Right. And why don't we take a look at that? And All right. Right. Okay. Uh, why not? Go from there. It was originally yes. called Moments Without Proper Names, but somebody's changed the name of it. Yeah, that was like that. You look at that now? Yeah. Okay. from an interview that you gave in the New York Times in the 60s, and it's about this period. Um, I became a writer, I became a writer and a musician when I was living in Paris in 1950 and working full time for life. I found there was so much inside me from my childhood that I needed more than photography to get it out. I wanted to write poetry, music, and fiction, and I decided I wanted to direct movies someday. I took each one in order and did every one. What, what, how did you, um, I mean, how did you just do that? I mean, what clip? <laughs> I mean, it's easy to say, right? I mean. Well, you know, it, 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 I look back in retrospect, it's, it's, it's all pretty wonderful. I've had some rough times, but I've had some beautiful times. And the people who, if, if the people who've inspired me and have come to me when I needed the most, for instance, the thing that, first started me, that, that brought about the first movie, uh, was uh, <coughs> Carl Mylands was a life photographer and writer, and that I used to sit and talk about Kansas and my experiences here as a youth. And one day he said, uh, you got a novel on you. I said, Carl, I can't write a novel. He said, you ever try? I said, no. Uh, he said, go home this weekend and try. <laughs> so I went home that weekend and I wrote seven triple space pages. And uh, <laughs> for some reason or other, I put the learning tree at the top. And I took it back to Carl and I showed it to him and he said, hmm. I said, well, what do you think? Mind if I show this to somebody? I said, no. Two days later, I got a call from a gentleman and he said, hello, uh, I'm a friend of Carl Mylands and I would like to take you to lunch. I said, yes, what's your name? He said, Evan Thomas. 
I said, well, if you're a friend of Carl's, yes, where do you want to have lunch? He told me. And I went to Carl's, and said, Carl's, a guy named Evan Thomas who wants to take me to lunch. Evan Thomas called you? I said, yeah. You know who that is? I said, no. He said, that's the executive vice president of Harper and Row. I said, oh my God, you better go to lunch with me. He says, yeah, I better have. <laughs> <coughs> well, we went to lunch, and we met Evan, taking off a wrap, and Evan said to me, uh, uh, well now, uh, Mr. Parks, uh, we can only pay you $5,000 because it's your first book and we don't know. We want your novel very badly. I said, novel? He said, yeah, yeah. Uh, he said, I said, Mr. He says, come on back. And he had his table reserved and halfway back he said, now we can offer you $7,000. That's uh, about how high as we can do. go. You know, you've never written a book before. I said, well, but Mr. Sonny, he says, come on back and he sat down. He said, the highest I can go is $10,000. <laughs> Carl gulped, gulped, I gulped, and uh, I said, Mr. Thomas, I don't know whether I can write another word. I've been trying to tell you that all the way here at this table. But since you offered me all that money, I'm damn well going to try. <laughs> uh, that's how the learning tree came about. <laughs> and uh, and now it's now approaching the 60th printing. That was in 1962. But along the way, John Cassavetes called me up and said, from, from Hollywood, he said, Gordon, I just read The Learning Tree. Uh, you got to make a film. I said, uh, what do you mean? I have to make a film. He said, you have to direct it. I said, John, there are no, there are no black directors in Hollywood. There are not going to be any black directors. You know that. He said, well, let's try. He said, I, got another, I know a guy here just stupid enough to do it. <laughs> I said, yeah. And he said, can you get out here day after tomorrow? And I said, oh, yeah. He said, come to Warner Brothers Studio. And I said, all right. I flew out there. John Cassavetes was there. He introduced me to Kenny Hyman, whose father owned the studio. And Kenny, and, uh, his name was uh, John. Uh, yeah, well, John. John. John, John you know, yeah. Oh, no, his name was Kenny. Uh, Kenny is at, uh, said to me, uh, look, uh, John tells me he wants to do a film. I said, yeah. John wants me to do a film. He said, well, well I read the one uh, of a learning tree and I read another book he wrote called Choice of Weapons. I said, yeah. He said, well, which one do you want to do first? I said, this guy's kidding me, you know what I mean? This is the first five minutes. Cassavetes has fled, and the guy said to me, Kenny said to me, Kenny Hyman says, uh, look, I want to do the film, I'm serious. I said, okay. He said, who do you want to write the screenplay? I said, I don't know anybody out here. He said, why don't you write your own novel? I said, okay. <laughs> he said, I hear you're a composer. I said, yeah. Why don't you compose the music for me? why not? I thought he was lying to me anyway, you know. <laughs> then he said, well now, since you're going to be the first black director in Hollywood, you need some clout. And uh, I suggest that you produce it for, Holly, for the Warner Brothers. <laughs> I said, why not? <laughs> I didn't believe a guy, that word this guy was telling me. And so I signed contracts and he saw it flashed across the nation. And they had hired the first black director, so there I was. And I then went on to do something that you will possibly ask me about. <laughs> what I did then. <laughs> right, well, we're going to dwell that? a little longer I was there. scared to death. Mm. So, so um, I mean, what was his motivation, do you think? Pardon? Ken, what was Ken's motivation? I mean, what Ken, uh, Kenny Hyman was just a nice guy. He was another, uh, Madeline Murphy, he was another Lieberman, he was another Carl Mylands. Uh, he was honestly, and sincerely telling me that he wanted me to become a, a black, first black director in Hollywood. And he was willing to back it up since his father owned the studio. Right. And he stayed behind me and he put up the millions to do it. And he would, it was just that simple. So it wasn't, wasn't difficult. That I had done the difficult part of writing the novel. Right. So what was it like on the set? Like, what was the first day of principal photography like for you? You must have been. Uh, I, Naturally, uh, you, with all that responsibility, I was scared to death. But I, I, had, I knew my lenses, having worked for Life magazine. 
I, I, I wrote, it was an autobiographical novel, I had lived it. I wrote the screenplay, it was, the, it was the first, one of the first screenplays that Warner Brothers ever accepted without a rewrite, because it was my story, and I knew it. And they said, there's nothing we can tell you, it's, it's okay, let's go. The first day, I went, I hired uh, Bernie uh, Guffey, who had shot Bonnie and Clyde as my cameraman, because uh, I admired his work uh, that he had done, Bonnie and Clyde, and then a lot of work. And he came out of retirement to do the film. A lot of white <coughs> technicians left other films to come and work on that film, simply because it was a historic event. It was a film of love. I must admit that the first night uh, we went to Kansas, where my, I was born, to shoot all the trucks from Hollywood, the actors. And uh, I remember knocking on Bernie's door at 12 o'clock at night before the first morning of shooting. He, didn't, he said, come in, Parks. <laughs> I walked in, I said, how'd you know it was me? He said, I've been through this before with a thousand young directors, you know? He said, you're gonna be all right. And you get up on that train tomorrow, you know, uh, and you say, camera, action, just look out there and know which way you're going because you probably won't know, but fake it, don't let the crew know it. <laughs> but I was pretty sure of myself, and the camera rolls up there, I looked, I looked across Kansas Prairie, and I looked over there, and miles over I knew my mother and father were in segregated graves lying there. And it gave me an inspiration, and Kyle Johnson, the young man who was going to play the part of me, I, <coughs> I said, I had told him about 10 minutes before that this was my life story and it was in his hands. And he said, uh, it's in good hands, don't worry about it. And Kyle did a wonderful job. And so after the film was started, everything was uh, not easy, but I was confident that I had enough good people around me to help me through it. And I was very smart in hiring the best people that I could find. Mm -hmm. and, and in the editing process, were there any tugs the of war? editing yeah, process, were there any tugs of war that happened in the course of editing the uh, book? Not too much. Uh, you see, having written a novel and a screenplay, uh, and being the director, <laughs> I really had no time. <laughs> Nobody was ready to argue with me, you know what I mean? Um, but I invited them to because I, I knew that there were things I didn't know. And I had a very fine editor, and he, he would tell me something, well, I suggest this, but if you don't like it, you know, it's all right. I said, no, <laughs> I think you're right. And uh, I, it was a matter of give and take. And the studio didn't studio, impose? No, they, they let it all fall in my lap and uh, hoped that I didn't fall on my face. <laughs> and. Uh, when it opened up on Broadway and I invited my family, I, my two of my brothers, and my, my sisters and my brother had never been on a plane before and I invited them from Kansas. And I was at the airport afraid the plane was going to crash. And my brother walked in, he was a big shot that night at the opening in, in, <laughs> in New York. I was just a little guy. <laughs> and boy, you're going to be all right. <laughs> And it was a great moment for me. But the great moment was when I was shooting it. That, that, when you see it, as you know, you shot film, uh, uh, it's fine after you shoot it, but when you're shooting it, that's, uh, that's a wonderful time. Right, right, right. Well, we have the film here. Um, we have a clip. Um, maybe you could describe the story, just give a brief synopsis of, of, of the film, of what it's about. And the, then the clip that we're going to show is, um, it's a scene where Newt is um, talking with Uncle Rob, and um, maybe you could kind of set that up for us oh. in terms of what the context of that. Well, um, Uncle Rob, or my blind uncle, and <clears throat> with my mentor, I, he, he had been an explosion, and his eyes were blown out, <clears throat> and so his fingers blown off. He made brooms, and I. Uh, <clears throat> walked around with him around selling rooms in Fort Scott, Kansas. Uh, in the <clears throat> story of the novel, my girlfriend is made pregnant by a white boy. And the town, uh, and, and uh, well, the, the, 
the father of the squirrel deserves Fort Scott and making it a texture to uh, California. I'm very upset and I talked to my Uncle Rob about it. I go to see him and uh, he talks to me. I think that's, that's what this scene is all about. Okay. I haven't seen it in a long time myself. Right, okay. So can we jump ahead to the learning tree clip? We need about another 30 seconds, Susan. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did. We did sort of jump that over. It's just going to take another 30 seconds to get it um, okay. queued up. So, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <coughs> I was just going to ask you, was, um, was this just a single film deal with the studio, or, or were there other films that were connected with your, your original deal? Yeah. Uh, no, that's, that's just a one film deal. The next, before I could do another film for them, uh, MGM had called me because uh, to do the film called Shaft, <coughs> and uh, that's how that happened. Right. But uh, I would gladly have done another film for Warner Brothers because I felt very good about what they had done. And how was it received? The Learning, learning Tree. Tree. Yeah. Very well. Uh, got to very good reviews. Uh, I think uh, it's especially in New York, blacks and whites would all come together you know, in the lobby and they were all, after I'd seen it, they were all sort of staring at one another, looking at one another. <laughs> I, you know, <coughs> I've often wondered about the book's success. I really have. I've written 16 books on it. But I've wondered why the learning tree has been such a success. It's been taught in school to all the countries in 12 languages. I get letters from kids from all over the world, and also from the choice of weapons. Um, and I've lectured to uh, high school uh, English teachers who teach the book, and to, to uh, <coughs> librarians, and ask them, you know, why is the book so successful? And they said, well, because it's so well balanced. There were good blacks in it, there were bad blacks, there were good whites, there were uh, bad wife, and there's one wonderful woman who was my mother, Sarah, threading the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why they say they teach it, because it's a well-balanced book. Great. Okay, let's take a look at it now. So, what, how, what was your vision? At the, I mean, this was 1968, 69, this was done, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. What, what was your vision as a director? I mean, did you see yourself on a, on a path going somewhere as a director, or it was run down and who knew what was coming next? I mean, what? Well, I, I don't know. I, uh, I didn't have any set pattern. I wanted to, I, I knew that I had gotten a taste of making film, and I knew I, I loved it, and, uh, and I knew that uh, I, I was not going to go back to still photography altogether. But I was going to try to do more films, but I didn't look for another film I could do as well that I, they said I'd done the learning trip. Um, it was uh, difficult to find subject matter right away. And I wanted to do a choice of weapons, but that was a little bit too advanced for me as far as I was concerned. Choice of weapons? Yeah, mm -hmm. I so think so. Subject matter was a little beyond me yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had written about it, but mm -hmm. the photograph got a, it was a different thing. And so were you looking about for um, guides and, and, and people to learn from and work with? I mean, did you have a sense of, of, of who you might want to collaborate with as a filmmaker, or, or that, that access wasn't there for you? Well, I, I didn't think of, um, you know, collaborating with anybody. I just thought of getting a good, good project. Writing, either writing my own project, and I knew very well that I couldn't write one successful book after another, mm -hmm. that I'd have to look around for screenplays. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I didn't have to do that because uh, MGM came to me for the shaft. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so I, my looking was cut sharp. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the screenplay that uh, the author had done of it. Uh, and I told the studio, and I said, well, uh, come out to Hollywood and 
find another writer and do it uh, out here and do it to your satisfaction and to our satisfaction. And that's what I did. And I went out and found a young man by the name of John D.F. Black who understood what I wanted to do. And we got together and he brought a screenplay in a few weeks that both the studio liked and I liked and we went to work. I went looking for a star to do chef. Mm -hmm. And so let me, can you just briefly um, give us a little thumbnail sketch of the, of the story of Shaft? Story of Shaft? Well, <laughs> it's a, about a, a detective, a young black detective, a private eye, <laughs> who is sent out to rescue a college girl from the mafia who, who, that has kidnapped her to sort of uh, get back at his, her father, who's a, a Harlem gangster, and in the rackets himself. Uh, the girl is wholly innocent. Uh, it's shaft assignment by Bumpy, who is uh, the girl's father, to rescue her from the mafia, who is holding her as hostage. Okay, and we have a clip that we can show of Shaft. What's the clip? The clip is, it's the Soulville sequence where he's just walking through Harlem, through the streets, tracking her down, or looking for her, in search of her. Right. And it um, happens to have a cameo by uh, uh, a Gordon, someone named Gordon Parks. <laughs> you might recognize him. Uh, by the way, I got Isaac Hayes for music, and I loved his music. I uh, did an unusual thing in Hollywood, I brought him right on the set while we were editing so that he could see the clips every day. And he had seven pieces of his own. He would compose, write the music. And I wanted him to be in spirit with the film. So after he did his work, we wrapped about a 35 piece big, big symphony orchestra around it. And it was a tremendously successful uh, music. Well, he did won an Academy Award. He won the Academy Award. That score. That That's year. right. <laughs> Did you have a sense of how powerful it was? In that? Did you have a sense of how pow powerful it was going to be in that time? Yeah. I didn't know. The f I had look. I did the film up for a while. You know, to tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we had fun. Uh, first off, my son put Richard Roundtree on me, and Richard Roundtree had never acted in his life. Uh, and my son kept asking me, "Dad, you gotta see him. You gotta see him." I said, well, but David, he's never acted. Just look at him, man, just look at him. Well, I said, all right, send him in. He came in, and I said, do you, do you know what a, what a screen test is? He said, no. <laughs> I said, have you ever acted? No. I said, well, my son wants you to be shaft, and we laughed. But meanwhile, he saw a lot of other actors there who were very fine actors. And Richard had made up his mind right then and there that he was not going to get the part. But I said, you go to lunch, here are some lines, and when you come back, we're going to read these lines to you, and you're going to react to them. So we put a fake mustache on him, uh, a turtleneck sweater, and put a gun holster over his shoulder. And then we asked him questions. And he just threw him a line, threw him a line, he just, he just threw the lines away. He didn't try to act. He knew he wasn't going to get the part. And later on he told me, he said, I did that because I just knew I wasn't going to get the part, so I said, you did exactly what I wanted you to do. You didn't try to act, you just was natural. So I called up Jim Aubrey and, and, uh, at the MGM Studios with him, and I said, Jim, I think I found Shaft. He said, well, rush, get the rushes out to me this evening. He called me the next morning and he said, you got it, go with it. Now, some funny things happened along the way that you would like to know about. Uh, got the crew all together. Ready to shoot in New York, got the whole crew there. Jim Aubrey calls from California and says, Gordon, cancel out New York, fire everybody but Roundtree, come to Hollywood and do shafts here. I called up Mr. Aubrey and said, Mr. Aubrey, if that happens, you're going to get yourself another director. Uh, we can't shoot shaft and Hollywood is going to be just another TV show. We have to need the smell of New York. And 
I got two of my assistants, we went out to Hollywood, and I told Jim Walton the biggest lie I, I, I've ever told in my life. We sat down, and I said, why do you want me to shoot it out here, Jim? He said, we're going to run into money problems back in New York. The weather's going to change on you. I said, Jim, I have a camera that can change summer to winter, winter to fall. <laughs> And he believed it. <laughs> he said, all right, go on back with no flaw in the ass. I said, okay. He went back. I remember the first night, uh, the film, I didn't, I'd seen that film so many times, I was cutting it. I went home and went to bed. It opened on Broadway. At three o'clock in the morning, my son David called me. He said, Dad, get up. Get up. I said, what? what what's happening, David? You called me at three o'clock. He said, get up here, come up to Broadway, you got to see this, you'll never see this again in your life. Well, I went up to Broadway, and sure enough, they, they were wrapped around the block. The ushers were charging 20, 20 people $20 to slip them in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they weren't able to close that show down for three days, you know, and we knew we had a success. So Jim sent me off to London to show it to the, to the English press before it we went to England. Well. Uh, the English press saw it, and in some place, the, 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 uh, uh, the writers said, one of the writers said, I, I see that. Uh, now, you, you, one of the bloke is calling the other mother. You mother. What is a mother? But you didn't call him a mother. <laughs> I said, well, I'm lazy in the audience. I can't tell you, you know what I mean? But I got it across to him. But in any case, uh, uh, yeah, one of the bloke calling the other mother. <laughs> So I went back there when she had to open up in London, and uh, there was another film there that I'd wanted very much to do for MGM that someone else did, it was done in, in, in Ireland. And uh, they called me up and they said, uh, Mr. Pops, uh, uh, would you like to see something? We'll take it down to uh, Piccadilly Square. And I said, yeah, what, what? I said, I know, know that there, my film's running down there. And, well, I know, but uh, there's another film that you wanted to do, that you were hot on doing. I said, yes. Well, would you like to come down? I said, well, okay, bring me down. They came up in a Rolls Royce and took me down there. And I went and I see this English film there. I said, she you bring me down here and embarrass me? And I said, no, the line around the block is for shops. It's not for that film at all. <laughs> I was very happy about that. Well, let's, let's quickly take a look at this brief sequence. Where did this take you as a director? I mean, what happened from here that was... It took me the shaft big score. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was a tremendous success. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it told Hollywood that, that they had a crossover, that, that many whites would see it as blacks, and that uh, they had a big film. And uh, <clears throat> they sent me to Europe and cut several places. And, to accompany the shows for the opening, so forth, so on. And, but uh, what turned out to be a lark turned out to be, a, uh, you know, tremendous success for me. Right. So, did you have, like, another? Did, did you have somewhere else that you saw yourself going at this time? I, I guess what I'm because the films after you know, Shaft's Big Score and Super Cops, but then came Lead Belly, mm -hmm. which. Is my favorite film of all the films. It had a deep, deep impact on me. And how? I mean, was that something that was brewing there? But but I, I didn't really didn't want know to, how to get I, there. I, I didn't want to do any more film, particularly like Shaft. I did that. I, 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 once you get into it, to it, you, you have to make a living. Mm -hmm. You have to keep going to keep your name alive. I didn't. I, I didn't. I don't frown on Shaft's big score. It was not, not a good film too. Uh, but uh, it's not the film. I want, I want my films to say something. Mm -hmm. uh, I want my books to say something. I want my music to say something. Uh, and that kind of film just didn't say enough for me. It made, it helped the bank account and uh, all that sort of thing, but didn't do the soul any good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it gave a lot of young blacks a chance to act and, and uh, get behind the camera uh, for the first time in their lives. I took them behind and gave them that experience. So in that way, it was uh, uh, very uh, profitable mm -hmm. to, to what I, I was really going for, you know, uh, to, to help 
some of that opened up industry to other blacks mm -hmm. out there. And who were some of the people that, that um, benefited from that? Oh, they were, they were behind I had uh, behind the camera, uh, not only that, I had three black trainees, well, uh, that took them from different, uh, they were uh, an Asian trainee, I think it was a Mexican boy, and two black kids. Now they were brought on the set. Uh, if they wanted to be a director, they brought my coffee and did what I wanted to do, and they watched me. They wanted to be a writer, a screenwriter, or if they wanted to be one of the light men, they watched until when they got off the film, then they had certificates so that they could work on other films. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to go to the Hollywood Directors Guild with this problem, and they backed me up, and we got together in New York, and everybody decided that trainees should be taken on uh, each film, and I think they still take trainees on, on different films. Right, right. So that's uh, what Shaft did, more than learning to did. Right. You know. It made you a commercial success yeah, in a yeah, way. Commercial success. It's in a way set that. Mm -hmm. it's, it set that moment right, or that right. gave you the clout that you needed. Right. So how did um, how did you? Sometimes that can be a a trap in a way um, and create. You know, it's hard in a way to break away from that. How did you how did you break from that and go in the opposite direction? Really, with a film like Lead Belly. I mean, that's. Not easy. You know. Well, what do you think about Lead Belly was a very famous folk, folk hero. Uh, his music's been copied by the Beatles, by mm -hmm. people all over, uh, and was imprisoned uh, for killing some. <coughs> uh, they say he killed two people down south. But uh, uh, I always let, loved Lead Belly's music. I loved his energy, despite his problems. I didn't know for sure whether he killed anybody or not. And how he sang his way out of the jails in <coughs> somewhere in Texas. Uh, I was given a screenplay again, but this time by Frankie Alvin's The Paramount. And had it, uh, to me, and then I, I liked it. And the writer and I worked on it for two months. And uh, I went to... Uh, Texas to do the film, and found Roger Mosley uh, to, to do the part of Lead Belly, who uh, had learned to sing and play the guitar. I think they're marvelous job. Yeah, they studied yeah. the film. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have. A, we I'd love to talk a little more about it, but um, we have a, a clip that mm -hmm. starts where he's gotten out of prison and oh, yeah. he's going back to visit to to see where he. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can describe. Well, it. he. he uh, he spent years in jail, and finally the governor of Texas told him that if, when he left office, he let Billy play it for him. And there's a very degrading scene in front of the house where the governor throws a cigar at him. And uh, he tells him that when he's, uh, when he leaves his office, uh, boy, I'm going to give you a pardon. Well, let Billy never believe, believed him. <coughs> uh, he was still in jail. When, when the governor died, he didn't give him a pardon, but he'd been in jail for quite some time. He was, his hair grayed and everything. Uh, is this no, the this same? Is where he goes back to where he Oh, this lived is the same, yeah. When lived. he goes back to where he lived, right. and where he meets a woman who is very beautiful and glamorous. This is where, they, where he, we should just show the scene. It's yeah. where he, he <laughs> the, there's, a, there's a white family living in the Oh, yeah. Houses. Living in his father's house. They've taken over his father's house, the sharecroppers. And he meets a little girl on the road who was his illegitimate daughter and he'd never seen her before. <coughs> Let's take a look at that scene. Okay. The film is epic, that's why it's hard, you know, it's quite a, it spans quite a period of time. I had a hard time picking the clip because this film, it was so, there were so many powerful moments in it. But from here, I mean, Lead Belly went on to really triumphed in his own way. He went back to prison, but it was in prison that he really achieved fame with his music when, when uh, uh, John Lomax came and recorded his music and it ended up in the Library of Congress. And so the film, what, what was so powerful about the film for me was, was this image of, of pride and dignity and resistance, you know, in any, by any means necessary, really. And, and that was pretty stark, yeah. you know, in that time. This was 1976 when this film came out. And um, what, what nobody could figure out was why it disappeared. 
Well, uh, I'll tell you, Frank Yawlins, who loved Lead Belly, and as a college student, uh, sponsored him in, uh, in certain <coughs> cities to, to, to come and sing. And he did, kept up Carnegie Hall, and uh, <coughs> Yawlins, uh, as I say, stayed out for lunch too long, and in Hollywood, that's bad. When he came back, uh, someone else was sitting in his chair. We had just finished the film, and Barry Diller was now head of Paramount Studios. And Mr. Diller uh, had never heard of Lead Belly. And he, he called me and says, uh, Gordon, uh, let's go to the, to the control room and see the new film. She just finished. Well, uh, the albums had done seven films for Paramount. And I heard that Diller was going to kill all seven of them because he didn't want to spend his money promoting the albums his film. Uh, I was a little frightened. So when he called, I said, okay. However, the thing that saved me was uh, uh, Charlie Champlin at the uh, Los Angeles Times had seen my film the week before and said in the Los Angeles Times that the film was probably one of the best films of the year he'd ever seen. He said it's the best films he'd ever seen. So, Miller uh, couldn't kill that. But he did go to the control room, we looked at it, and he said, it's a great film. The studio is going to put a lot, of, a lot of money behind it. Okay? I said, fine. And he went right upstairs, and uh, so one of his young assistants said, he said, kill it. Just like that. And it began to appear in porno houses and things across the country. <laughs> and he called me up one day in New York after the press had gotten on to him and said, why aren't you doing something about this wonderful film? And he said, uh, ah, Gordon, uh, I don't want any more of this you know, ladies in the house. Uh, uh, bleep <laughs> and stuff. Uh, we're doing the best we can with this film. We're putting money into it, so forth. So, and then I, I'll have to be bleeped for <laughs> what I told Mr. Dillon. And I slammed the phone down. And he called back within an hour and said, "Look, I'm sorry about what I said." And uh, I said, "Well, it's too late for that. I called you a no good so and so and so, and that's what you are, and that's what you will remain." <laughs> As far as I know, as long as I know, and that ended that. But the films, uh, the Los Angeles Times came out the next week and said that the film was art. It will never die, and so it's never died. I went to Europe with it twice and showed it, and three thousand people got up and cheered in, in England. Uh, and saw it. So it was, it, it, it's still, still here. So correct me if I'm wrong. I remember, maybe I'm remembering incorrectly. I thought there was also a scenario where it was made with tax shelter money. Was that, and, and so that there was a problem because it sort of had to fail in order to, no, that wasn't true. No, that's okay. not true, no. No, Paramount put up the money and Frank Yellows put the money up. Right, okay. mm. I guess that was part of the rumors that was going yeah, around. All sorts of rumors, just... all sorts of rumors. But Let Belay has lived. Yes, indeed. And has been into a lot of festivals and won several. In fact, it won the <coughs> festival in Texas that year. And Mr. Diller had done uh, Lipstick. And lipstick was booed, and <laughs> that belly got first place. And Mr. Diller was called and told that, well, Mr. Diller, your lead belly just got first place. He said, so what? <laughs> so I don't think he liked it too much. So um, after that, the, the, actually the last feature so far, I'm sure there's another one down the road, that you made um, was in about seven or eight years later at PBS. Um, um, can you talk about that? With the Odyssey of Solomon North. Well, that, I did that for play, play, the American Playhouse. Yeah. I, I love that film too, and I love Avery Brooks. That was his first big uh, feature film. Uh, it was about a black man, a, a free black man who was sold into slavery. And <coughs> with his. Uh, out his family, and his family was out him rather, for something like 12 years. And uh, he was finally uh, rescued 
and brought back to New York, he was from New York, brought back to New York. And it was a very difficult uh, screenplay to do and a very difficult film to do. But uh, Avery Brooks was just wonderful in it. So was this a project that, that? Yes, we do, uh, we do. But why don't we take a look at that and then we can what is continue it on. It's where he's um, uh, about to, um, to run off and um, uh, he's tripped up by the elder Noah. And oh, yeah. they're in the woods, they're talking. Yeah, yeah, he's about to run away, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, let's take a look at that. <coughs> I sit here all night and keep asking you things, but I, I think I need to share you with our audience here. So maybe what we can do is open it up to questions and kind of continue you in that way. Hmm? You feel okay, it. yeah. Um, are there any questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. Um, with the slides, I think you're referring to some of the more abstract yeah. stuff. You said the, some of your newer work of the slides that were shown earlier, were they composites? How, what exactly were you doing there? <coughs> no, I just finished a novel on an English uh, writer, J.M.W. Turner, who you may, may not know about. He's a hero in England in the 19th century. <coughs> and his watercolors and his oils. I, <clears throat> took eight years and I wrote the novel based on his life. And when I saw his watercolors, I became very impressed with them. And I came back from England and started doing watercolors myself. Then I decided that I needed to add another dimension. So one day I just picked up a leaf and put it against the watercolor. I didn't put it right against it. I had to juxtapose it in a way so that they were, you couldn't tell whether the painting ended, uh, the, the leaf ended. Then I just photographed it in 35 millimeter. And that was the, I did the whole book that way for Little Brown, which is <clears throat> wound up in a book called Arias in Silence, where I wrote poetry along with it. And now I've just finished the second book, which is being printed in Hong Kong called uh, uh, Glimpses Toward Infinity. But it's a, uh, a new thing, and I've done so much crime, so much poverty, so much fashion, so much. I wanted to do something for myself, and this is what I'm doing, and I, I get a lot of solace from it. It doesn't mean that I've stopped doing still for photography altogether, but it's, it's something that gives, it gives me the relief from the other stuff. But it's, the difficulty is superimposing the other against the other in such a way that that you get the depth, but that depth comes with the use of the camera lens, how far you cut it down, how much depth you get in your painting, and bring the two images together. Up here. How was uh, your experience in Brazil when you were down there? Uh, he was asking me about your experience in Brazil. Um, your experiences in Brazil. Brazil? Flavio, you mean? Uh, Flavio was, I had been sent to Brazil by Life Magazine to do a story on poverty. Uh, I had interviewed a lot of fathers and things, and it, it, it seemed as though it was going to be just another dull story. Uh, and I was sitting by, <coughs> beneath the jacaranda tree one day on the mountainside in the favela, uh, in the catacumba, which is, means death in Portuguese. And it was terribly hot, my ankles were swollen, and I'd interviewed about four fathers and a couple of mothers. This little boy came by with a tin of water on his head, and uh, he was 12 years old, and he had on a pair of khaki pants. And I said to the interpreter, look, that's poverty. And this kid smiled, a beautiful smile. And I, 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 I smiled back and we followed him up the hill. Well, it wound up that I, <clears throat> he had a shack on the mom's side. He was taking care of his eight brothers and sisters. He was dying from bronchial asthma and several other diseases. Uh, I came back to Life magazine and said, look, I found 
poverty and his worst. Uh, I want to photograph this boy and not a father and his family. And uh, they said, go ahead. Sounds like a wonderful story, a tragic story, but I went ahead. Uh, I stayed with Flavio. I, I left my clothes down in the hotel on, on the kind of cabana. And I wanted to live up in the shack with Flavio and his, and his brothers and sisters. They all slept, the mother and the father, all the kids slept in one bed, except Zacharias, the, little, the smallest child, slept in a, in a bed. And I stayed with him for about three months, shooting, uh, recording uh, uh, my diary that life asked me to keep. And when I went back to New York with my story, uh, they laid it out, and the editor who I was working with showed it to me. One picture of Flavio lying sick in bed, and one picture of a rich Brazilian woman. And I asked my editor, where are the rest of the pictures? He said, that's it. I said, that's it. That's it. Uh, Ed thinks, there was a magic editor, he thinks that this is the wrong time to do a story on poverty when we were fighting television. Well, I went into my office and I wrote my resignation out to Life magazine, telling it that I was sorry after all my years of life. I was quitting like this. So Tim Foote, my editor, says, don't send it in right now, wait for a couple of days. I waited till over the weekend and he said, something wonderful happened. And he showed me a clipping in the paper <coughs> where the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, had said, if they don't do something about poverty in Latin America, immediately, the communists are going to take over. I got seven pages and three pages for diary. Well, and a lot of letters came from some of some you people, family may have sent. Within three weeks, I had received $35,000. And then all the letters from kids, from everybody, said, you got to go back and get Flavio. You can't leave him there. Uh, I asked life for $25,000 more, and they gave me $40,000. I went back and I brought, I bought the family a home out of the favela and brought uh, Flavio back to America to a clinic at Denver, Colorado, who promised to save his life. Uh, they did save his, his life. He stayed there for two years. And I came back from Paris to be with him in New York when he came through New York on his way back to Brazil. Flavio is now in his 40s. He has three children, one is named Gordon. And he's a wonderful guy. <laughs> uh, you wonder sometimes about, uh, especially I did the years that I did so much work on poverty, about entering people's lives and if, whether, deciding whether or not you're playing the part of God and is it helping them or hurting them. The Fontenelle family in Harlem was just the same, absolutely the same number of people in it. Father had lost his job. Uh, Mama was a wonderful woman. And life asked me why black people were rioting. It was during the late 60s. I said, I can live with a black family in Harlem and show you in no time why a black, a black family riots in Harlem. And it was a wonderful uh, situation as far as the story was concerned because the father just lost his job. He began to beat up on his kids began to get drunk, and, and Miss Fontenelle was an absolutely wonderful woman. Uh, he had thrown little Norman out. His name was Norman Fontenelle. He had thrown little Norman out in the streets on a cold day, and I found him standing by a tin can hitting himself. And I asked him if he wanted to go home. He said, no. I went home to see his mother. Father was drunk, sitting slouched over. She was, had a big cauldron of hot water for clothes, she was boiling. And I went back the next day, and she had her arm around little Richard, crying. And I said, well, what's wrong, Miss Fontenelle? And I took my 35 millimeter up, and I shot a quick shot. And she said, oh, I sent Big Norman to the hospital. I said, what did you do? She said, you know that cauldron of hot, the cauldron of hot water? I tipped it over on but I poured a quart of honey in it first so it would stick. And when I, when I got to the hospital, I took little Norman with me. 
A <coughs> big normally had no skin on him whatsoever. Only a ring could be recognized him by. And the Norman said, that's not my daddy. I said, this is your daddy. And he said, uh, Big Norman says to me, why did she do it? Why did she do it? His eyes were closed. I said, well, why did you beat her, Mr. Fontenelle? I don't know why I beat her. I don't know why I beat her. Well, Mr. Fontenelle, had he been smart, he left the hospital and gone, turn right and keep walking. Because Mr. Fontenelle was what we call the Akichi woman who knows more ways to destroy you than the Russian army. <laughs> You know, and, but again, I told Life Magazine that I wanted that family out of that tenement before the story was published, and I wanted them to give me $50,000 to buy the family home and relocate them. They did. I took them to a nice little neighborhood on Long Island, grass on the lawn, Miss Fontenelle had all new furniture, and the kids were in did schools. One boy got out of the jail, read a choice, my book of choice of weapons, was in there on drugs. He got out of jail, and he was home. Mr. Fontenelle has gotten a job by, through the efforts of life and myself, and to celebrate, he goes out and gets drunk, comes home at night, <coughs> has a cigarette, sets the couch on fire, the house burns down, he dies in the fire, and little Kenneth dies in the fire, my favorite. Okay. I had to rush back from California. Well, Ms. Fontenelle said, uh, Mr. Parks, I don't want anything more to do with that house. I said, but it belongs to you. I don't want it. Take him back to Harlem. So we did. I went to see her about six months later. I took her $500, and it was cold in the apartment. I asked her where the rest of the family was. She said, I haven't seen my three daughters for at least uh, two months. They're out on the street. And the only one who was with her was little Richard, who she loved, and she thinks it's going, it's going to be a success. Uh, it was Christmas Eve. I didn't have nerve to say Merry Christmas. But as I left, she said, well, Merry Christmas, Mr. Parks. So I said, uh, Happy New Year, Ms. Now I'll be back to see you. Little Richard called me about two years later and said, Mama's very sick. Uh, maybe you better come up to see her. So I went to see her and I asked what was wrong. She said, well, I've got diabetes and I've got cancer of the throat and I'm dying. Three of my daughters have AIDS. And little Robert is in the hospital for drugs. And I said, well, I'll do what I can to get Norman out. And I was successful in getting Norman out for his mother's funeral. Mm. And she died about three weeks later. Uh, and the, <clears throat> the girls, all three of the girls died, died from AIDS. But that's the tragedy of it. <coughs> the little Richard, who doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, is married now, has a child, Gordon, he named him. <laughs> and I bought little Richard's uh, recording equipment, and my daughter calls up now and then to see how little Richard's doing. Rich, little Richard's is six foot now and weighs about 195 pounds, <laughs> but we still call him little Richard. But <clears throat> uh, he's lived up to his mother's promises and wishes. But again, I wonder about that family. And she told me once, she said, you probably feel very badly about the house burning down and what has happened, but you tried to help us, and I th I'm thankful for that. But that's all you can do. I, if I saw another family in, in those straits, I would try to help them too. Mm. My pipe is in my hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm trying to smoke one pipe in the, in the morning, one pipe in the afternoon, out of the evening, but I'm not being very successful. <laughs> but uh, everybody wants that pipe, <laughs> the peep. My father smoked a pipe, and I followed his footsteps. Uh, yeah, does the uh, 
sound track to accompany the slides commercially available? What was that? The pipe. The, the, the music that you composed that accompanied the slides, is it available? Oh, oh yes. The, the music, I just, uh, well, I did the music for the second chapter, which is called Shaspik's Score. No, 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 for the slides in the very, oh, very beginning. I was, the score for, for uh, Martin. Oh, the score for Martin. Well, there's a videotape of that, uh, which they broadcast. I'm sorry, I thought you said Chef. Uh, there's a videotape of that. Uh, they play it uh, maybe two or three times a year. What is the title? Martin. Mm -hmm. Martin. Yeah, ballet, Martin. Uh, Jimmy Griffin may be able to get you <laughs> a copy of it, if, if you're a nice boy. Well. <laughs> it's a wonderful really to be back home. I, uh, coming in on a plane, uh, uh, I was thinking about all of my good friends that I knew here that are gone. I've just written a poem about them, Bud Kelly, uh, Lonnie, Thomas, Howard Barksdale, Nina, uh, Ed Salters, and I go all the way back. I just did this wonderful long poem about those friends of mine who were taken away so early and why, you know. But this has been a great stepping stone for me, Minnesota. I learned a lot here. I had some hard times here. I had some hard times in Kansas. <coughs> but I tell young black students especially that they're going to have hardships. All kids from, who were live come from groups uh, where, they, where they're, they're subject to prejudice and discrimination and bigotry. I'm going to have a hard time. But instead of reacting with a gun or a knife, if they store all that anger here uh, and the hatred is, both, is bound to be there, and let it come out in your emotions into whatever you ha happen to want to pursue in life, if you want music, you got emotions there. If I didn't, if I had not gone through what I've been through, I would not have the emotions from my music, from my poetry, from my writing, from my films, from my photography, whatever. I wouldn't wish that on your children, what I went through. I wouldn't wish that on any child. And it's a shame that one has to gain emotions through situations of that sort. But I still realize that you can be blonde and blue-eyed and still be hated by somebody. So uh, it's, it's all over the place. The main thing to do is to store that in here and use it and not let the anger eat you up. My father's wisest words to me were, waltz around your enemies and do a foxtrot on their back. <laughs> and my mother would never allow me to come home and complain about having been a failure or something I denied them simply because I was black. Her <coughs> words were needed. <coughs> and now she was a real wonderful woman. I was that if a white boy can do it, you can do it. And probably do it better. So don't don't come home crying to me. Get out there and do it. Mm. You know, Nike tennis shoes could have used her. <laughs> Same old time. Jimmy Griffin was, what are you, Jimmy, six foot two, three. He was the center. I was the captain, and I was called the preacher. And we played every night uh, somewhere. We played matinees on Sunday, and we were never supposed to lose. <laughs> and we had a gentleman who managed us, a man named Harry Crump, uh, who actually robbed us. We didn't, after each game, we didn't have much to buy a steak. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience. We traveled all over the Northwest, and uh, it was a survival. And Jimmy uh, sent me a picture of that team. 
house of David. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to see. Who did um, Shaft in Africa? He, he was asking, who did Shaft in Africa? Uh, I mean, a Frenchman uh, did a Shaft in Africa. I saw the script and didn't like it and turned it down. I wanted them to do it. I think they're going to do another Shaft. Shaft's grandson. <laughs> I would have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Susan? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. This is the last yeah, question. This is the last question. I thought so, so I thought I'd take advantage of <laughs> I think the, the irony of seeing Avery Brooks as a freed man in slavery and the vision for young black males now to see him as the captain of a ship in the future is very powerful. So thanks for giving him that start. I'd like to know. What is your relationship with the new uh, black directors of today? Did you open the doors, the Spike Lees, the, the John Singletons? Because I think the young people need to know that you paved the way for these brothers today. Do they consult with you and pull, call on you to serve as an advisor to? What was that? Um, <laughs> that was a comment and a question. Um, she was commenting about the um, juxtaposition of the start you gave Avery Brooks as a free man, in a sense, in slavery, and today as the captain of a, of a ship out in space, in that span. Um, and then the, the question was, um, what is your relationship with the young black directors today? Do they consult with you? Do they call on you? What, what, is, what happens? Uh, the young black directors are Call me, uh, hey, hi, Pops, how you doing? And all of them, so Spike Lee calls me down and says, and writes me and says, I love you. <laughs> and that's it, Spike, you know. Uh, but then, <laughs> and I won't write Spike, but why do you love me, Spike? But he's a nice, he's a great guy. A lot of the young, most young directors uh, uh, either call me and say hello and uh, tell me what they're doing. and. Uh, I'm very happy about that they're getting a chance, you know, and I, there's some people complain about this, some of the, look, they're doing uh, what they feel is best for them right now, and as they <clears throat> progress, they will do things that they want to do more when they're able to do it and they get the money to do it, but right now I'm happy with the fact that, that they're doing it, get, getting a chance, and uh, uh, they're, they're going to be, a lot of young directors, uh, uh, black directors out there, and women directors too. I've, <clears throat> my, I've been a great one to use women in uh, important roles in some of the films. A woman, I had one woman assistant director. She bossed everybody around, everybody around including me. <laughs> but uh, everybody deserves a chance. And you certainly done your part. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think we've um, used up all our time. So on behalf of everybody, I just want to really thank you from the bottom of my heart for blessing us with your presence here and your vision out there in the world, which is still unfolding. And um, continue on. And thank well, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. For